Today we're going to talk about uh, everyone's favorite topic, the prostate. So um, the prostate is a male exocrine gland that produces about 25 to 30 percent of, seminal, of the seminal fluid. And uh, unlike most organs, it actually continues to grow with age. And so it's actually uh, uh, it's interesting because uh, in US males, it's actually considered to be an inevitable disease of male aging, uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, this large prostate at later ages. One of the problems with, that, with this large prostate is that uh, it begins to compress the urethra and also the bladder, which causes frequent painful and nocturnal urination. One of the things about uh, uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, this uh, uh, enlarged prostate with age, is that um, 90% of men in their 80s in industrialized populations will experience this. So that's why it's considered this inevitable aspect of male aging. It's the most common disease of aging experienced by men. And so in the US, 40% of men will require treatment for BPH in their lifetime. Worldwide, uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia uh, is uh, the 25th uh, contributor to disability adjusted life years. And in the US, it's actually the 12th. And this is something that just affects men yet it's the 12th largest contributor to disability-adjusted life years lost. Keep in mind, epilepsy is 14 and Parkinson's is 15. It's actually also a really interesting example of antagonistic pleiotropy. So higher levels of endogenous and exogenous testosterone and other androgens are associated with larger prostate size. The best pharmacological interventions involve androgen deprivation, uh, and in Unix, you see no evidence of BPH whatsoever. Well, higher androgens also correlate with reproductive effort in males. And in particular, rapid increases in prostate size at early ages, especially in early puberty, would uh, get the reproductive system online faster and could lead to some early reproductive benefits. And of course, all of the uh, consequences occur in selection shadow, so there wouldn't be any selection against this. So the etiology isn't terribly well characterized, despite the fact that it affects so many men. We know that aging, androgens, and obesity and metabolic syndrome all play pretty important roles. And so um, there's great evidence in industrialized society, both uh, in humans and in mouse models, that uh, um, uh, individuals with metabolic syndrome or uh, very high levels of glucose uh, have larger prostates. And so in particular, there are a large number of IGF uh, receptors on the prostate. Now. Um, while this is a major problem in industrialized populations, metabolic syndrome in general, it isn't a problem in all societies. And so I work with the Shimane. They're four horticulturalists in the Bolivian Amazon. Uh, you've heard a lot about them uh, last couple of days. It's a population of about 16,000 individuals in the Amazon, uh, spread out across about 95 villages. There, there's varying degrees of market integration across all these communities, but uh, in general, about 92% of calories come from horticulture, hunting, fishing, and uh, foraging. Only about 5% of calories come from the market. Uh, Chimane men average about four and a half more hours of physical activity than US males, which is equivalent to about 850 additional calories. And on average in men, the, uh, the rates of obesity are about eight times lower for Chimane men compared to US men. Chimane also experience a very high uh, parasite and pathogen load. So 70% of adults suffer from uh, intestinal helminths and about 50% of all individuals in the population at any given time are anemic. And so together, all these factors, this high level of physical activity, lower food availability, and uh, high parasite and pathogen load, I mean, they have an overall lower energy budget than men in industrialized populations. And so this forces a trade-off. And one of the first trade-offs in males to change is levels of testosterone. So a high testosterone phenotype is really quite energetically expensive to maintain. So you put on all this extra muscle mass, which uh, uh, requires energy of its own, the anabolic effects of testosterone. You've also got catabolic effects, so you're burning off all of your uh, fat reserves. And so it's unsurprising that uh, among the Chimane, you see about 30% lower levels of testosterone uh, in adult males and age-matched males for, this is the Chimane here, and this is uh, US age-matched males here. You see the same thing in the Ache, uh, uh, Virginia has some evidence uh, from the Bolivian highlands, but generally men in uh, a situation where there's lower overall energy budget have lower levels of testosterone. 
And so for the Shimane, with low levels of androgens, low levels of obesity, and low levels of metabolic syndrome, we'd hypothesize that prostate growth is going to be smaller for the Chimane, and we're going to have overall lower levels of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. One thing to keep in mind is that so far, all of this research on prostate growth and benign prosthetic hyperplasia has been done in industrialized populations, where we can easily go and hunt and gather 20,000 calories at McDonald's. But that hasn't been the case throughout most of human evolution. So in order to test this, um, we conducted abdominal ultrasounds with 348 Shimane men aged 40 to 80. Uh, abdominal ultrasounds, uh, they're highly correlated with uh, um, the kind of the gold standard transrectal ultrasound, uh, but they're much more pleasant and much less invasive. Um, at the same time, we did morning fasting blood draws from these men. Uh, median age for this group was about 50. We did point of care glycosylated hemoglobin as a measure of kind of an integrated measure of glucose exposure. And then at the lab, I measured uh, serum testosterone, prostate specific antigen, and sex hormone binding globulin. And so if you look at prostate volume by age in industrialized populations, you can see here that all these populations uh, start out rather high. So anatomical BPH is 20 cubic centimeters. So the average male in most of these populations by age 45 is already experiencing some level of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. You see worse outcomes at around uh, 40 cubic centimeters. And so um, you can see these men are kind of just having a continual increase in uh, prostate size with age in industrialized populations. Shimane have much lower levels of prostate size as measured by transabdominal ultrasound. And not only is it lower, but it's also a shallower rate of change with age. And so um, one comment that you can make on this is, well, you know, Chimane are about 10% shorter than US males. And so, uh, and you know, lots of organs do scale to height. So even if you took a very conservative measure and said, okay, let's increase Chimane prostate size by 10% uh, to match their heights to uh, US males or uh, Dutch males, you still see significantly lower rates of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So on average, Chimane have prostates that are about 13.6 cubic centimeters smaller than US males. That's about the size of one of those like K-cups from uh, you know, those coffee things. And that doesn't seem like a huge amount, but when that's compressing your urethra, that's actually a really big deal. We also have a much shallower rate of change with age. And so compared to age-matched US males, uh, Chimani prostates are about 62% smaller. And the age standardized prevalence of BPH uh, for Chimani males is about 28% compared to 60% for the same US males. More importantly, though, uh, more advanced cases of benign prosthetic hyperplasia above 40 cubic centimeters, which is about the level that you'd probably seek treatment, uh, are almost non existent. Only two men out of 350. In the US, about 50% of males in their 70s have prostates greater than 40 cc's. And so if you think about the size of uh, uh, a US male prostate um, age 70 and a Chimani male prostate age 70, a US male uh, has a prostate about the size of an egg, whereas a Chimani male has a prostate about the size of the yolk of that egg. So this is a, a pretty significant difference. Now, despite having significantly lower levels of testosterone, about 30% lower, uh, testosterone is still associated with prostate size. And in particular, men in the two highest quintiles of testosterone were at about two and a half times uh, larger risk of having benign prosthetic hyperplasia. And as you'd expect, um, Chimani men with higher prostate-specific antigen had larger prostate size. You can see here compared to uh, NHANES for men in the same group, this is Chimani on the bottom and NHANES on the top, uh, that Chimani males do appear to have a much lower and shallower rate of uh, change of prostate-specific antigen across the lifespan. Uh, Chimani men, though, who were above the cutoff, the kind of the standard American clinical cutoff of four nanograms per mil, were 10 times more likely to experience benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Now, interestingly, despite subclinical levels of HbA1c, so no male in this sample had um, uh, had high levels of uh, glycosylated hemoglobin. So usually you say about uh, it's cut off here, but uh, this is glycosylated hemoglobin. And uh, usually uh, about 6% glycosylated hemoglobin is considered kind of the standard um, cutoff for diabetes risk factors. You can see here Chimani males were very low levels. But despite that, 
there was still a positive association between glycosylated hemoglobin and prostate size. And uh, each 1% increase in glycosylated hemoglobin was about the equivalent of 17 years of aging. Now, there are a few limitations here. So in this sample, we can't really differentiate between benign prosthetic hyperplasia and other prosthetic issues. So if any of these men did have prostate cancer, then th those large prostates could actually be due to that. Same with prostatitis. If anything, though, that really just strengthens our results because then one or two of those large prostates could have actually been not due to benign prosthetic hyperplasia. This has a couple of important clinical implications, though. And so kind of the first off is that despite low levels of glycosylated hemoglobin and very low diabetes risk, there was still a strong association in these very subclinical levels of glycosylated hemoglobin and prostate size. But really importantly right now is that um, there's this large increase in the number of men seeking low testosterone therapies. And so in the last decade, the number of prescriptions for testosterone in the US has gone up fourfold. Um, we saw the same thing actually between 1985 and uh, 2001 with women seeking hormone replacement therapy. And then in 2001, we realized that what a risk we were putting all of these women for breast cancer and endometrial and ovarian cancers. And so uh, I think that this is a really important thing to keep in mind is that we don't necessarily need that extra testosterone and it might have some really deleterious consequences. We're actually doing a really large scale experiment right now, all the men getting this testosterone replacement therapy. And I think that the results are gonna be bad in a few years when uh, studies come to light. Now, in terms of reproduction and prostate size, we didn't find any association between the number of offspring a man had, uh, uh, live births or um, uh, all pregnancies uh, between that and prostate size. However, in a small subsample of men that we did have age at first reproduction, those men that had an earlier age at first reproduction had larger prostates uh, controlling for age. And there's been a couple of meta-analyses that have shown that uh, uh, most of the variance in treatment outcomes for benign prosthetic hyperplasia and most longitudinal growth is actually due to the baseline start of prostate size. And so is benign prosthetic hyperplasia inevitable? Well, probably throughout most of human history, we would have had low levels of obesity and lower levels of androgens. And so it's unlikely that uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia would have been much of an issue. And if it was much of an issue, it would have occurred well into selection shadow. And so there'd be very little uh, selective pressure against this. And so um, thank you all very much. And um, thank you, Randy and Charlie and Cynthia and the committee for uh, inviting me out. There will be time for a question or two. Oh, I broke with tradition. Um, just a very quick comment. I just wanted to point, it out, point out that um, a few years ago, Peter Ellison and colleagues uh, published a paper where they showed that in non-Western populations, levels of salivary testosterone, at least, looked very different from Western men, and, and the profiles were flatter, and there wasn't the same age-related decline in testosterone across these populations. And I think that matches rather beautifully with your results for um, prostate size in the Germanes. So. Yeah, and uh, actually one of the things that I didn't get the chance to show here uh, was that we now have around um, uh, 1,200 individuals that we have testosterone measurements from about age 30 to about age 90, and we see a very, very low rate of change of testosterone with age. And uh, um, we now have around 10 years of longitudinal data, and so I'm working on uh, matching up individuals and doing some kind of longitudinal change studies as well. And so far, it looks like we're seeing much shallower rates of longitudinal change, not just the cross-sectional. So um, what's the probability that at least some of these uh, results could be explained by genetics? Well, uh, so there, there was one study a couple years ago, um, I want to say in like 2011, and it suggested that in terms of testosterone, uh, the variance in testosterone levels due to genetics was about like 2.8%. And so um, I don't know about the genetics of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. I don't think it's terribly well studied, despite the fact that it's such an important health concern. Um, uh, so I can't, I can't make too much of a comment on that, but I would guess that it's more about the environmental impacts and these uh, environment endocrine interactions. Um, you showed a p-value for the relationship between testosterone and BPH. Uh -huh. right? 
Um, but I didn't see uh, how much variation that explained in a statistical sense. And also, I'm curious whether you looked at it compared to something like BMI, if you also had that measure. We did. And so um, yeah, I didn't show the full model. Sorry, I didn't think I'd have time. But uh, um, in the full models, we have height, age, testosterone, and uh, HbA1c. And those all are in the same models. And the proportion of variance, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can check. Um, this is about to come out in um, Journal of Gerontology and Medical Sciences. And so it's impressed there and should be there shortly. Uh, rank order was glycosylated hemoglobin, and then age, and then testosterone. 